All right, ready to go. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the State Route Policy, uh, State Route 37 Policy Committee meeting of Thursday, December 1st, 2022. Uh, Drew, can you please call the roll so that we can confirm our quorum? Certainly. Uh, good morning, State Route 37 Policy Committee. I'll be taking roll alphabetically by county. We'll be starting with the county of Napa with uh, Mayor Leon Garcia. Here. Supervisor Alfredo Pedrosa. Here. Supervisor Belia Ramos. Here. Uh, County of Marin, Supervisor Judy Arnold. Here. Supervisor Damon Connolly. Mayor Eric Lucan. Here. Uh, County of Solano, Mayor Robert McConnell. Present. Uh, Vice Chair Aaron Hannigan had informed me she had a conflict this morning. And then Supervisor Jim Spearing. Present. County of Sonoma, Council Member Victoria Fleming. Here. Supervisor Susan Gorin. Present. And Chair David Rabbit. Here. I'd, I'd also like to acknowledge Caltrans District 4 Director Dina El Twanzi. Here. And then um, Andrew Vermeer from MTC. I uh, hear Drew Therese McMillan's in the audience too. I think, can you bring her into being a panelist? Here. Certainly. And then um, Executive Director Daryl Halls from Solano Transportation Authority. Here. Executive Director Kate Miller from Napa Valley Transportation Authority. Here. Executive Director Ann Richmond from Transportation, excuse me, Transportation Authority of Marin. Here, good morning. And then Deputy Executive Director James Cameron on behalf of Suzanne Smith for Sonoma County Transportation Authority. Good morning. I believe we have a quorum, Chair Rabbit. Great, thank you so much, Drew. Hey, and uh, before we move on with today's agenda items, I wanna take a moment uh, to recognize three committee members who are joining us today, or I believe are joining us today. I'm not sure if our new assembly member is with us uh, in that official capacity for the last time. Um, and first, I wanna recognize Judy Arnold. It's been, a, I think, a member of this committee since its inception. And uh, Judy has greatly contributed to our success thus far. Always a true states person, uh, looking out for the region's needs as well as her own county. Um, tenacious um, and persistent, and uh, absolutely love serving with Judy, not only on this panel, but on the other panels that we've all probably shared with her. Um, her presence will be missed. And Judy, just want to say thank you for your service to this body, um, to your county, uh, and to the region. Hey. And we will miss you. Hear me, Andy. Hello, everyone. Hi, Therese. And uh, speaking of Therese, next up is Therese McMillan, our executive director of MTC. Uh, she's been an instrumental participant in this committee for the last four years. And our relationship with MTC on all matters, Highway 37, I believe, has never been better. And we attribute that to Therese's leadership. And Therese, thank you so much for your service to the Highway 37 projects. Um, and to the region as well, and you certainly will be missed. And uh, lastly, our third departure is really, uh, I, I consider it a, a little bit of a shift. And uh, even though uh, no longer uh, an official committee member, uh, we now have a new stalwart advocate in the state assembly for Highway 37, and that's uh, certainly supervisor, uh, assembly member elect Damon Connolly. So Damon, Thank you for your service on this committee, uh, for all the work that you've done, and we look forward to continuing to work with you at the state level to move forward these projects and get Highway 37 back to where it should be serving the region uh, and its needs and transportation. So thank you. Thank you to, to, to everyone, and I'll open it up if there's anyone who'd like to also uh, laud our uh, uh, departures and just thank, thank everyone, especially at the end of the year as we reflect back on a lot of work. Uh, done over the course of time. Not all at once, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but again, thank you so much. Much appreciated, everyone. Thanks for all the great work. Um, with that, we'll move on then to opportunities for public comment, our second item on the agenda. And I'll look to Drew to see if there's any um, written correspondence and or anyone wanting to speak with us today. And if you could lead us through that, Drew, that'd be great. Certainly, Chair Rabbit. So I did receive one pre <laughs> comment from Edward Schultze. I did provide it to the policy committee as well as posted it online. And I do see one member of the public with their hand up right now. So I will share my screen. 
All righty, we have Steve Bertelbau up first. Steve, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you, Chair and members. Uh, Steve Bertelbau with the Transportation and Land Use Coalition. Uh, about a month ago, uh, there was an editorial in the uh, uh, in the IJ uh, that made a couple of comments that I think uh, we need to pay some attention to. Uh, the first was that the addition of another traffic lane will relieve the traffic jam. Uh, the Caltrans draft environmental impact report says that the new HOV lane will enable express bus service. People who carpool, van pool, or use the express bus will benefit, but single occupant drivers will still be stuck in traffic. The failure of the road widening to relieve congestion was highlighted in a webinar that MTC conducted earlier this week. That focused on the use of the road user charges to reduce peak hour congestion. And as expected, there was some resistance to such charges. And that brings us to the question of how will we pay for the SR37 project. Tolling of a road is similar to a road user charge, but the public needs to become more familiar with the possibilities of such changes. I suggest that it would be useful for members of the policy committee to take a look at the option which the state of Utah is offering to the owners of electric vehicles. Rather than paying an annual registration fee that is roughly equal to the gas tax paid by internal combustion vehicles, an electric vehicle owner can opt to pay a per mile charge, and that is likely to be less than the annual registration fee. It appears that that charge option is quite popular and is acquainting the friends and neighbors of EV owners with a concept. SR37 might benefit from a similar option in California, and it might be good for this project to have us follow Utah's lead. So, Member Connolly, uh, here is something you can take on. Thank you. All right, thank you, Steve. Uh, Chair Rabbit, I don't see any other members of the public who wish to speak on items not on the regular agenda. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate you leading us through that, Drew. I apologize. I'm on week four of this cough that I just can't seem to get rid of in spite of the multiple cough drops in my mouth at the present. Uh, we'll move on to the consent calendar. That's the minutes of September 1st, 2022, uh, the SR 37 policy committee meeting. And I look to my colleagues if there's any Questions, comments, or concerns on the minutes? And if not, can I get a motion to approve? Aaron, Aaron will move. Second to Garcia. All right, so we have a motion and a second. And with that, Drew, uh, suppose we need to do a roll call on those minutes. We'll do, we'll mm -hmm. do a roll call. We'll start with Supervisor Arnold. I think we lost her. Uh, Supervisor Connolly. Aye. Council Member Fleming. Um, Mayor Garcia? Yes. Supervisor Gorin? Aye. Uh, Mayor Lucan? Aye. Mayor McConnell? Abstain. Supervisor Pedrosa? Yes. Supervisor Ramos? Yes. Supervisor Spearing? Yes. And Chair Rabbit? Aye. Hoping we'll see that as passing. Great. Thank you, Drew. Uh, moving on to 4.1, uh, planning and environmental leakages study. We have Tammy Massengale from uh, Caltrans to give us a brief presentation. Tammy? Good morning, everybody. Happy December. I can't believe I'm saying that. Um, <laughs> let me just get my presentation up running here. All right. Thank you all for having um, the Pell team give you a presentation on where we're at. And we have really good news to share with you today. So um, first, I wanted to spend just a moment talking about our schedule and um, where we're at. So um, we're at a really good point. You can see here at the end, December 2022, and we are um, going to be finalizing the Pell report, and I will go over um, what will be in that report with you that you have not heard yet. Um, 
So that's really good news. We'll have it out before the end of the year. And just to um, bring everybody back, since we haven't met for a little bit, um, the everything that we've done on the Pell is based on this purpose statement that we all worked on um, for a long time. So um, I just wanted to bring us back to that. I won't go through it again because I know that you've all heard it. So let's talk a little bit. When I left you um, a, a few months ago, we had talked about where the team was with coming up with a preferred alternative. And we had mentioned at the last meeting that the Pell study team was recommending alternative five. And alternative five is uh, runs along the corridor where the current 37 is. Uh, the way that we are imagining the new um, roadway, it will be um, designed as an expressway. There would be two traveled lanes in each direction with a shoulder running lane for peak period use. Uh, we, the posted speed limit would be 60 miles an hour. There would be accommodations for bikes and pedestrians. It would primarily be a causeway with some limited embankment. And I'll go through that a little bit in more detail later on about where that embankment would be. And it, the, the great thing about the causeway option is it does allow for um, removal of fill that's currently uh, supporting the structure that's out there now. And then there would be access at a variety of points through either interchanges, intersections, or some type of direct access points. And we've worked closely with SMART during the Pell process and it, it allows for the opportunity for the rail to be adjacent to the corridor if SMART chooses to do that. This is just a um, cross section, if you will, or a, a, a view of the, um, of, the, uh, of the structure of what it would look like. You can see that we would have optional shoulder running lanes on each side. There would be a bike and pedestrian um, on one side. There would be two traveled lanes and then, of course, a median for safety purposes. All right, so we went forward to the uh, stakeholder working group with this recommendation and we had broad support. Uh, they were very favorable of uh, the choice of moving forward with alternative five. Um, they really want us to accelerate the ultimate um, or the long-term project. Um, you'll notice through here, I will be using long-term more than ultimate just because um, there's been some concerns with terminology of ultimate. So that's why I made that clarification there. Um, they really want us to get reliable bus service in the corridor, and I know that both STA and TAM are working on that right now. And they want us to ensure that the causeway will be compatible with rail, transit, bikes, and pedestrian, which we have told them it will be. So where, where do we go from here? Now that we've finished up the Pell study, um, we have to take several steps before we can get into CEQA and NEPA. And some of them will be kind of part of CEQA and NEPA, but where are we gonna place the road? Is it gonna be on the north side of the existing road? Is it gonna be on the south side? Is there gonna be a combination? Um, how are we gonna design those interchanges and where exactly will they be located? What access points do we want to maintain um, on, the, uh, on the elevated causeway? And, and this is a little uh, bit of a, a confusing point for folks because when we're looking at this, we're looking at what's gonna, what the projections are gonna be in 2130 when it comes to sea level rise. So a lot of the access points that are out there today may not be there uh, due to the inundation of sea level rise. Also, is, are the bike and pedestrian lanes going to be on the structure? Are they gonna be cantilevered? Are they gonna, when we get to, um, you know, at grade, are they gonna move off of the, um, the, the highway system? So those sorts of things. And then of course, really the, the billion, multi-billion dollar question is uh, the future funding and is there gonna be tolling um, on, on the future 37? And I mentioned about the rail and transit earlier, but coordinating with those. 
So part of the Pell uh, study is going to be an implementation plan, and that's where I'd really like to spend most of our time today. We had four, we originally had three approaches that we went forward with to the stakeholder working group and the resource agencies. Uh, the first approach was to prepare one environmental document for the entire corridor. There are a lot of challenges with that approach. Um, one of them would be a lot of rework um, as we move through the process because we wouldn't be able to just go through uh, the environmental process, design it and build it because of funding. Um, and, and then for us as the NEPA lead agency at Caltrans, we have to have funding in the design, full funding in the design phase before we can sign an environmental document. And we see that as being very challenging to have that um, funding available to. Um, another option would be to prepare a programmatic environmental document. Um, and, and, and I'm sure you all are aware of programmatic documents, but they're very similar to what we've done with the Pell, except there's not an official decision document for CEQA and NEPA that come out of it. And the team felt that this was um, a, definitely a possibility, but it would really put us back a couple of years in our schedule. And it, it would be frustrating, I think, for everybody to have us go back and do basically another study again. Our third approach was to deliver the preferred alternative, uh, so again, along the corridor with a variety of small projects. Uh, they would each have logical termini and independent utility, and there would be multiple environmental documents prepared. This gets a little sticky with this approach if we just make that assumption. And the sticky part is uh, the resource agencies are gonna want to see cumulative impacts for the entire corridor in each of the environmental documents. And technically we wouldn't have to do that, but then we might not be able to get a permit or approval during PADD. So that, that is definitely a challenge. Um, and we would only be looking at environmental impacts for a small area instead of looking at it more globally. So when we talked with the resource agencies about this approach, they had a lot of concerns. So we came up with this um, approach for, and this is the approach that we have decided to move forward with in the implementation plan. And what it will be is there will be um, several smaller individual projects, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Each one of them will have logical termini and independent utility. Um, they will have individual environmental documents and then we'll move forward as they're funded. And what's really important here is that each of those environmental documents will include a programmatic cumulative analysis for the preferred alternative. Now, this isn't as complicated as it may seem because we've done a lot of that uh, programmatic cumulative analysis in the PEL. So a lot of that can be incorporated right into those environmental documents. Secondly, we would enter into programmatic uh, agreements with both US Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service for the corridor. And then we would what's called tier off of that programmatic document for each of the individual projects. Uh, the resource agencies are on board with this, which is a really, um, a, a really great thing. So what we did when we started to look at how we could put this project together, if you will, with smaller individual buildable sections, if you will, is we looked at any constructability challenges, what the interchanges look like, how we would transition to them. Uh, would there be changes in travel patterns um, address to those? We would address those access issues that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there are going to be long bridge structures and their approaches. So how are we going to, you know, find a good ending point for those? And then uh, for uh, the Code of Federal Regulations 771-111 Section F requires us to demonstrate logical termini, independent utility, and, and this is a really important and 
that that project would not restrict the consideration of other alternatives for the next project moving forward. So um, we also have some other considerations that we all need to take into account. Funding is the is the big um, elephant in the room, if you will. Um, the geography is really diverse. And so when I was talking about the funding, um, we're looking at, at uh, smaller projects that could be more easily fundable. Um, and, and so that's what I meant by funding availability. And then it also, um, we're looking at those areas as being the most important that address near-term flooding that affects um, the corridor. And then we're also looking at um, the operational <coughs> performance. We wanted to make sure that none of the projects would cause other problems along the corridor. And importantly uh, for our partners is that we would be able to coordinate the improvements and the mitigation that are going on with the other projects in the corridor. So um, this is what we have um, developed as projects that have uh, logical termini, independent utility could be built without affecting negatively affecting another section of the corridor. And I'm, I'm going to go through these in detail um, in, in the next slide. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. The one thing that I, before I jump, that I wanted to emphasize to everybody is we have three very large interchanges. We have the interchange at 37 and 101, we have the 37, 101, and then we have Walnut Avenue. Those interchanges are going to have to be um, adjusted or rebuilt, depending on which one. Uh, they can move independently they, as, as a project, they could be incorporated into other projects. So I'll talk about that a little bit more in detail, but I wanted to set that up for you. So, and, and I wanted to emphasize too that, that the numerical um, system that we're using does not um, identify a priority. It's just for identification purposes, okay? We started from the West and went to the East. So. Um, section one, um, a lot of the interchange at 37 and 101 is elevated, um, but there um, are some opportunities for us to uh, work on that interchange and have better connected um, connectivity to the, um, the race structure, the causeway. It could be a standalone project, but if money became available, it could be combined with project number two, which I'll talk about in just a minute. So project number two is the US 101 to Atherton Avenue project. Um, and this project is a um, shop project that Ahmed is gonna talk about in just a little bit. So I'm not gonna talk about this a lot, but this is gonna be our first project out of the gate, if you will, from the Pell. Um, this will be a causeway the entire distance from that interchange over to a location right here. And that's right where the geography starts to change and uh, it would get above the uh, sea level rise inundation. Two could be uh, built independently or it could com be combined with two or one. Next, we have from Atherton Avenue to the Petaluma River Bridge on the western side. And this is all above sea level rise, but it would need to be expanded to meet the other needs that we have in the corridor, such as the uh, pedestrian and bicycle access, and also the uh, bus on shoulders, the peak period shoulder lanes. This could be built independently, or it could be combined with projects two and four, okay? And then we have uh, the Petaluma River Bridge over to the San Pablo Bay National Wildlife Refuge headquarters. And this may seem like an interesting place to stop, but it's actually where the geography goes up again and gets out of sea level rise. So this is probably going to be entirely a large bridge structure and then a causeway from the Petaluma River. Um, and it would tie in to um, 
project number three and project number five, okay? Now, number five is um, gonna be mostly at grade. There may be some embankment there to bring the structure to the grade. Um, and, and this one could, this project could be uh, combined with project number four or number six, which is the interchange, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, this one would really make sense to be combined to four or to six, um, but it could be standalone. So that's gonna be a decision that will be made further on. And really it's gonna be a funding decision. And then six, we have the interchange at Sears Point. The interchange right now um, is being envisioned as being um, completely west of the uh, smart tracks. Um, but it could change and it could go over the smart tracks. So, so it's very flexible with how that interchange is going to be done. Um, it could be done as a standalone project if it didn't have to go over the smart tracks, which would then mean it had to go over to Lake Creek. Um, and again, six could be combined with either five or seven. And seven is this very long stretch. Basically, it's the two lane section. Uh, this would all be causeway um, and it would go from the interchange at uh, 121 over to the Walnut Ave Avenue interchange. And it could be combined again with, um, with the interchange at uh, 121 or with, Mer with um, the interchange at uh, Walnut Avenue. Now eight, which is our last um, section, would start at the Walnut Avenue interchange if it was included in eight, or it would end or, or start at the end of the interchange if, if the interchange was included with seven. Um, and eight is really interesting because a lot of this is already out of sea level rise, but there are some areas that will um, that, that face projected sea level rise. So there would be some work that would need to be done here on eight. And there are some interchanges that would need to um, be brought up to meet the standards of, especially the bus on shoulder. That's really the, um, the biggest um, challenge with this um, particular um, section of the corridor. So that's how we're moving forward with the implementation plan. We have worked really closely with um, the ESC, the PLT, and all of the um, stakeholders. Um, but I'm more, you know, to come up with this implementation plan, but I'm here if you have any questions for me. Great, thank you, Tammy, appreciate that. You're welcome. Drew, if we could pull down that slide so I can just see everyone. I see a couple of hands up, just wanna make sure I go in the right order here. And um, I see committee member uh, Spearing. Please, Jim. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Tammy, great presentation. You know, very easy to follow and understand. So, thank you. This is very, very good work. Uh, the question I had is, why is the tolling sort of a question mark in this? I mean, without the tolling, I don't see how you maintain this facility or how we fund going forward without that. So, so why is that sort of a question mark in the presentation? Um, really, it's because we don't have funding identified for tolling yet. There's not a tolling mechanism right now. So once a tolling mechanism is identified, then it would move forward. Okay, yeah, it would just seem like if we said that that is something that needs to be included, then that helps us move that, get that authority to do it. So it just seems like, you know, we're, we're not emphasizing that where we need to, because we're going to need, a, you know, assistance from the CTC, as you know, for to be able to do that. And uh, the, the other question I had, uh, you show all these segments. Did you say that they can be done individually? I mean, we could get clearance and then that portion could be done? Yes, correct. correct. Okay. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you, Tammy. Great presentation. Yep. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, committee member uh, McConnell. I think you might be on mute. Yep. Thank you for the presentation. I found it most informative. There are two concerns that I have. 
Uh, recently at our local water agency, we were informed that sea level rise may be as high as 110 inches, um, which was twice what I'd heard previously. It's not in all areas, and it's more oriented towards second, certain bays. Uh, I would like to get some information from the staff here as to how that might impact the 37 project and whether or not we need to alter any of those developments as a result of that now updated projected rise of 110 inches in some areas. Secondly, to, uh, to acquaint you with some local developments with respect to project number eight. Um, about six weeks ago, escrow closed on 156 acres of North Mare Island, which is the portion you see adjacent to the bridge. They have the developer and the owner of that property has two years from now to provide a specific plan as to what to do with that location. And part of that location development is going to depend very, very heavily upon how this 37 Walnut Avenue interchange is designed and built. So since this can be approached as a separate uh, project, I would like to give some early consideration to the development of that project so that the developer of that North Mare Island project can rely upon it. That will probably be the largest development in the Bay Area when it is undertaken. So it is significant and will have substantial financial consequences to this area and the entire North Bay. So thank you for your kind consideration. Thank you. Um, I will answer the question about the sea level rise. I think that's the one mostly that I can answer. Uh, we are taking into account um, sea level rise projections from both uh, BCDC and the Ocean Protection Council, and the causeway will be um, in excess of 30 feet high to accommodate that. And I appreciate you letting us know. Um, we did hear from um, Daryl on the potential development on Mare Island. So we have had some discussions about that. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Committee Member Lucan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Tammy. Uh, just a couple quick questions. I know you mentioned that the uh, the section IDs are in no way a, a prioritization, um, but I am curious, what, what are the different inputs that would potentially affect um, prioritization? Uh, would it be, you know, environmental restoration on a particular segment that, you know, frees up the rest of them for mitigation? Is it going to be flood control or flood mitigation? Is it going to be where potential future tolling would exist? I imagine if that's the route we go, that might be the section you do first. So what are those different inputs that might um, identify which section is logical to try to focus on and do first? I think it's going to come down to um, this team, the ESC, the PLT working together on what the priorities are in the corridor and, and deciding which one goes first. Uh, we're not saying in the Pell which one should be the highest priority. I think that's going to be for a future decision. And, and I think really the... Uh, the critical factor is going to be what can we fund. Um, the section that is the most vulnerable to sea level rise is being addressed and it'll be um, talked about here in a future presentation today. So that one is being addressed immediately. Um, other than that, it, it's funding that's really driving it. Okay. And, and is there a logical location forward for a tolling gantry should that should that be the option or is that not even really been looked at yet yeah no we haven't gotten that detailed okay um and then my last one um i know uh, uh section six which is the interchange um tying right into seven which is probably the longest and you know maybe one of the more expensive segments just given the length of the causeway um, would it make sense if, or could it be done rather than doing seven all in one section to maybe combine a small portion of seven with six? I think logically a causeway over Tolle Creek combined with that interchange project makes a, a potential project there because um, doing, doing all that causeway in one section is going to be a, a big lift. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's going to be real. It's going to be a very big lift. Uh, that section and the interchanges are probably going to be the most expensive individual components. Um, I don't really want to commit to being able to break that section up, and this is the reason. Um, if we were to do part of the section, 
you're gonna have to come back down to the original ground and either you're gonna have to put in structure and then throw it away, which is a huge expense, or you're gonna have to put embankment in. And that area is so ecologically sensitive that we would probably have a very, very hard time getting that through our resource agencies. Gotcha, okay. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, committee member uh, Gorin. Uh, good morning, everyone. And Tammy, I agree with our previous comments. Your presentation was very clear and I love how you segmented the projects. I have a couple of, uh, and I'm, let me just confirm that there will be, uh, you know, we've had a, a number of conversations in previous policy committee meetings about the relationship between an interim project versus an ultimate project. And I think you just laid out the ultimate project. So are we now just sort of aiming for an ultimate project section by section, or are we still thinking interim project along certain sections? Um, right now, the approach is to can move forward with the Sears Point to Mare Island Improvement Project, which is considered an interim project. The other project that you've heard us talk about as an interim project is the um, flood reduction project. And that was a, and you're going to hear this in a minute, so I don't want to steal Ahmed's thunder, but um, that was originally scoped for inundation at 2050. And now they have pivoted and they're moving it to inundation levels of 2130. So that is going to um, pivot, if you will, to the ultimate solution or the long-term solution. I know there uh, will be a briefing on this at BCDC this afternoon. Some of you will be participating in that and we'll have a discussion about the role of the resource agencies. But you did mention the potential of expanding some part of the bridge and the extension from the intersection at Sears Point over Tolle Creek. Um, and that may be concerning to the resource agencies. So I wouldn't, I, I, I would maybe support that approach as a way to move us toward an ultimate project and really focus the conversations with the resource agencies to figure out the sensitivity and where that landing might like uh, might be likely. I, I think we're gonna have that discussion ultimately anyway. So we might as well engage in that right now. Are we gonna have an opportunity uh, in today's um, under 4.5 to talk about the Sears Point and Mare Island uh, approaches? Uh, is that gonna be discussing the interim project a little later on? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay, so I'll save some of the questions for later, but generically the sections that you've all uh, uh, outlined today in the ultimate project, the only project uh, that is might be of concern regarding uh, the um, duplication of resources is the interim project between Sears Island and Mayor, Sears Point and Mayor Island. Is that correct? Everything else is probably what it needs to be constructed uh, right now or whenever we can finance it and will not have to be replaced. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I would agree with um, uh, Supervisor Spearing's comments about tolling. Uh, and I would love to uh, have a wheelbarrow and take it to Washington and uh, just harvest the dollars. But I think realistically, uh, we need to work on tolling probably in multiple segments uh, going forward. And I will again raise the concern that I've raised from the very beginning regarding tolling is that some people may use alternate routes to avoid the tolling. Um, and so therefore I'm concerned about um, potential traffic impacts through um, the Novato area, as well as Sonoma Valley and Napa Valley to avoid the tolling. But that being said, we've had discussion after discussion about various ways to finance this. And uh, we come down on the fact that it probably needs to be tolling but let's not lose sight of the potential impacts from the other state highways that are not prepared for a large amount of traffic. 
So thank you. I may have more questions in the future, but I really appreciate your clear presentation. Thank you. Uh, Dur uh, Committee Member Arnold. You're muted, Judy. Right, okay, you can go. you hear me now? We can. Okay, um, I think, um, I think uh, Supervisor Gorn's um, questions were, were mostly, or very uh, many that I was going to ask right now, which is really um, how the current plan is gonna have to change uh, if in, in what you just presented, uh, when we go for the final, the final plan. And I think that's something that we need to, that we need to look at and that we need to examine um, as we go, as we go forward. I also agree that I think uh, tolling is going to have to be in there and uh, the, 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 the sooner we, we did look at that and start planning for that, I think the better. I also, um, I know that, that many of us have heard from Congressman Huffman to uh, see what he, his, his, uh, his thoughts are, which I think many make sense. Have you talked to him? Is there a way that we can uh, um, have, uh, have him talk about what he sees uh, so that we can be in, informed of that, so that everyone can be informed of that? Um, have we looked at that? Uh, our team has not talked with him, but I believe um, that there have been communications with our Ledge Affairs office, but I'll, I'll leave that to someone from the district to respond to. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. I'll respond later. <laughs> okay. Committee member L. Tawansi. Thank you, Chair Rabbit. I just want to uh, quickly take this opportunity. I believe this may be Tammy's last meeting. Uh, Tammy has been really an incredible member of this team, and uh, she has retired, but she has kept on State Route 37, fell due to the importance of State Route 37. And I really wanted to uh, give a shout out to her. Um, her experience has helped our team tremendously. So thank you, Tammy, and uh, happy retirement. Thanks, Dina. Really appreciate it. <laughs> nice. I think uh, that goes for all of us, Tammy. Thank you so much <laughs> for the great work and um, all the best in retirement and uh, going forward. So thank you for that. Thank, thank you. you for, uh, thank you. Uh, letting us know that, um, uh, Dina. Appreciate that. I just, uh, if there's no more questions from my colleagues um, for myself, I just want to, um, I agree on the tolling question. It's inevitable. It should be included. Uh, from the get-go, and um, we need to just make sure that we continue to plan around that. Um, I think, ob obviously, uh, great presentation, Tammy, uh, very clear, and it's actually good to see the segments and, and descriptors um, and getting a little more detail as we go forward. Kind of re reiterates to me, to some degree, the phasing required to achieve the long-term or the ultimate project uh, that we have. I mean, certainly the grade differentials alone are going to make, uh, and I agree with you, Tammy, about the difficulty in breaking up some of those sections that with whatever it's going to be railway dollars on structure and or an expansion on fill um, and a difficulty of filling 30 feet on land that's not uh, very dry. Um, and so appreciate that. And to the prioritization that uh, uh, committee member Lucan brought up, I just wanna reiterate to me, congestion still is a, a major, major factor. And to the, to the extent, I know it's difficult because the prioritization of that section is probably the most expensive section, um, but the quality of life uh, impacts that those uh, commuters are um, dealing with today uh, would be, in my mind, something that um, we should at least prioritize to make sure that we continue to address it as quickly as possible. So I appreciate that uh, going forward. I understand the consequences around that as well. Um, I'll look again one last time to my colleagues. Uh, Committee Member Gordon, you have your hand up again. I do. I'm so sorry. I forgot to ask the question regarding the relationship of Regional Measure 3 and some of the improvements of this project, most specifically the design potentially around uh, Sears Point. Where is that measure? I've lost track of it. Is it still in litigation? And are we able to expend those funds when? Yes, it's still in litigation. And, you know, some of the and I don't know, is uh, 
I don't see Therese still on here, but it, it hopefully, you know, by March, February, the Supreme Court, I'm under the impression they will be taking it up. And so that, as you know, there is a chunk of money in, in RM3 for this project. So it might be helpful to have a discussion about when those funds become available, cross our fingers, um, what could those funds be used to do to plan uh, to get some of the ultimate project up and running? And I don't know who can answer that, but it, it regards prioritization and our previous discussions about projects on either end plus Sears Point. And where, what's our thinking on that? Yeah, I don't know if Andy might want to comment on that. Andy, you... Yeah, I, I can jump in, but I actually might want to defer to uh, one of the CTA directors. Uh, the RM3 money, as Jim described, uh, first of all, Andrew from your deputy executive director at MTC and Bay Area Toll Authority, uh, is under the litigation schedule that Jim described. So we're hoping to know more in the spring. But just as a reminder, the $100 million in RM3 is actually delegated to the four counties. So Bay Area Toll Authority doesn't really have a say in how that $100 million is broken out. Um, I think maybe Daryl or Ann might be best to describe what the current thinking is there. But it certainly is eligible for moving the projects forward. I can chime in if you want. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I would just say, I think Andy does have a say at MTC. Obviously, we're coordinating very closely with MTC and Caltrans. Um, so the $100 million, the focus was to, to, to advance the interim projects, whether that's in right away design, anything that needs to get the project shelf right ready. That's when he, and obviously, this was discussed two or three years ago before the lawsuit. Uh, we also have a project in, in Solano and Fairgrounds by in Vallejo that we got a commitment for 15 million. So the other 85 is supposed to go to the interim project, or it could lead to a, some of the advancement of the ultimate project. That's with the discretion of this policy group. So that's that's the only commitment we have at this point. And so, um, like I said, it's there's opportunity, and wherever we're at, like we, you know, right now we're trying to get design money for the interim project. If we had the RM3, we'd already have the design money for the interim project. Uh, Tammy mentioned about environmental funds for the ult ultimate project. We'd have some of the money for that as well. At least you have match money. So that's the advantage of the RM3 is we need that to advance the project and it give us a lot more discretion. And I, I, as I said, we, we'll be working closely with MTC and Caltrans on that. Thanks, Daryl. I thought maybe there was enough money to just complete the intersection at 121 and 37. Oh, wait, maybe not. <laughs> There's probably three or four of those small products we could, we could argue over which ones get completed first. So that's that, that gives you guys something to discuss right at a future meeting. Right. Yeah, well, Thank Supervisor, you. the 37-121 interchange actually is being funded through state shop funds. So I don't know if um, Dina has anything to add about that, but that, that sort of is a separately funded project okay. that is going to be built, hopefully, in coordination with the interim B and the Tolly Creek improvements. Appreciate that discussion, uh, you know, and I hate to say it, but 100 million is not what it used to be, apparently, and uh, with the soft costs involved, especially with this project, and I think um, <laughs> access to the money, um, ultimately, uh, with the dollars available through the um, at the federal level, and hopefully still at the state level, um, the engineering um, involved in it, the design involved in it, the environmental work involved in it um, will easily eat up uh, those kind of dollars. So um, uh, committee member Lucan. And, and I did want to say that was tongue in cheek, of course. I knew it was not going to complete that project, but maybe the next meeting we could have Dina comment on the work at Caltrans uh, regarding some of the projects, especially at this intersection. So I think we'd, I'd, I'd like to know how that's moving forward. So thanks. We'd be happy to do that, Supervisor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just one last question for Tammy, as far as these different, you know, sections that have been identified, uh, what, what is the next step? Is, is this just kind of preliminary brainstorming? Is Are these these sections going to be a little more set? Uh, can you maybe speak to that? They're ready um, when the money becomes available to move forward into environmental. Okay. Um, so I, I think my my feedback on that would just be I, I I understand the concern about not breaking up section seven, um, but I do wonder if there could be a seven A and a seven B um, given the 
given the overall length of it and just the tie into the interchange, I think it would be unfortunate to do the interchange and not do any portion of, of seven. Um, I do think there is a logical seven a that runs from the interchange over Tolle Creek to Tubbs Island, um, where maybe you could get down to grade. I know it's not ideal. It's always best to do it all in, in one, one fell swoop, but, um, there might be a, a smaller segment that could really tie in very well with that interchange. Uh, if that could be done, just wanted to offer those comments. Yeah, thank you. And we we've had those exact discussions, um, and and it's a possibility. And the thing that's really great about the Pell is that none of this is like in concrete. You have to do A, B, C, and D. Th this committee and the agencies can move forward and and be flexible and, and combine them, and and if necessary, even break them up. Appreciate that very much. I think, uh, and Tammy, once again, uh, thank you for your work. Um, it, it is a huge project, um, and uh, to the what you just said re, in, in regards to having uh, the flexibility uh, that'll be key going forward. I would imagine, uh, based upon the funding availability, uh, the timing of projects, the approvals on the uh, you know, through the environmental work and and whatnot, and the regulatory agencies. So. Uh, appreciate that very much. Do you have, you don't need any further direction from this body, uh, just the presentation, correct? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. And again, thank you so much and best of luck. In thank return. you. Uh, with that, um, I will ask Drew if there's anyone from the public who'd like to speak on item 4.1. Uh, yes, Chair Abbott, I do see three members of the public who wish to speak. And we will start with uh, Steve Bertelbau. Steve, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Yes, uh, thank you, Tammy, for that presentation. Uh, it did uh, knit a number of things together that, uh, that that's hard to see when you're looking at the individual parts. Um, I'm concerned about the uh, bus on shoulder approach. Um, there aren't very many concentrations that serve express buses so that if you want to actually uh, allow people to avoid the backup, uh, you're going to have to have an HOV lane on shoulder, basically. Um, and uh, that makes it a six lane project instead of a four lane project, which gets into great problems with uh, trying to reduce VMT. Um, so I'm wondering uh, well, how the bus on shoulder issue is going to get uh, evaluated. Uh, the other suggestion I have is that you could break uh, uh, part seven at the Sonoma Creek Bridge, uh, which might provide a, uh, a good landing method. And thank you for all of your work on this and enjoy your retirement. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, next I have in line is Joe Green Heffern. Joe, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Yes, um, Joe Green Heffern in Solano County. Um, I'm wondering, since I haven't seen the Pell report, if there's going to be any discussion of non-structural uh, options, not an alternative, but things that might help congestion relief in the near term, um, while the, particularly with the segment B interim project, but also with phasing of the ultimate project. And that has to do with separation of truck traffic and vehicle commute traffic by, t by time, by a time of day. So it seems that this would be a key issue for safety during um, all the various construction packages. And it needs to be, even though it might be a bigger issue for that, uh, component segment seven, it really needs to be looked at holistically as part of the Pell report of how this might be implemented and ours, is there a benefit from a safety and a congestion relief point of view, basically moving truck traffic to non-commute hours. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, next I have in line is Gita Tev. Gita, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you and me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, the Policy Committee and to Tammy for a very uh, elegant presentation showing very clearly how the segments might possibly be broken up in very pragmatic fashion. I really appreciate that because it makes it much more real. 
I have a comment on, um, I belong to the three chapter Sierra Club sea level rise group. And we have a great concern about the uh, wetlands in the area, which I know this committee is also concerned about. However, I would like to point out that in the entire presentation, in the design considerations, we would really like to see more clearly that the policy committee keeps the coordination of the ecology, you know, ecological mitigations very clearly in mind, because this is the most sensitive area of the entire bay. And it is the most opportune area to keep the bay alive, which it's dying. And that's an unfortunate fact. And as the sea level rises, we do not want to end up with a bathtub. We really need to encourage the wetlands to remain alive. One thing I'd point out is that uh, Supervisor Gorin pointed out that BCDC does have a meeting this afternoon. And one of the presentations there is about the existing buffer along Highway 37, the Section 7, the long section, has a buffer against the wave action from the bay. However, it is it has been dying in the last decade. It was considered for um, restoration, but that has not been done. Therefore, the restoration aspect or the mitigation for the amount of space that this very wide 120 foot segment is going to take is actually an important part of the design considerations. So Tammy, and Caltrans and the entire policy committee. I would like you to put that in as a line item as a in the design considerations of how to coordinate the most important mitigations first. Like that, that area needs to be saved in the next few years. And if, for example, section seven design is consi considered, the mitigation part is critical to it. How exactly we are going to keep it alive so that by the time we raise it up, there will be uh, a healthy marsh that we are saving. So the interim steps for the mitigation are as important as interim steps for the actual construction. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, next, uh, oh, Chair Rabbit, I don't see any other members of the public who wish to speak on this item. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate the uh, the input. <laughs> Excuse me again. Uh, with that, we will we'll move on to item four point two. <laughs> so sorry, the flood reduction project, and we have Ahmed uh, Rahid from uh, Caltrans to uh, give us an update on this. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ahmed Rahid. I'm the acting regional project manager from Caltrans for the 37 corridor. And this morning, I'll give you a, a brief overview of the 37 flood reduction project, uh, its current status and schedule. Uh, bear with me for a second. Uh, can you see it? Um, it's loading. It, we see it now. Thank you, Drew. So the project is located in Marin County. Uh, it starts from 101 uh, 37 intersection and goes all the way to Atherton Avenue to the east. Uh, within the project limit, the 37 uh, is a four lane expressway. And uh, this part of the 37 corridor is one of the most vulnerable section due to flooding. Uh, as you remember during, uh, within the past five years, we had to shut down these uh, uh, this part of 37 because of flooding. Uh, first time uh, was in 2017 uh, for 28 days and another time was in 2019 for almost eight days. And for some of the newer sea level rise modeling, uh, this part is also uh, prone to sea level rise and will be inundated by 2050. So this project will address the recurring flooding and also the projected sea level rise to year 2130. Uh, this slide shows the 
existing elevation along our project limit and also the surrounding levees. So just to clarify on the orientation, on the left side, the project starts at US 10137 intersection. At location one, uh, we have the Novato Creek Bridge, which we are going to replace. And the project will be terminating at location two, which is the Atherton Avenue under crossing. And this color-coded line, the green line means the existing elevation is uh, roughly 18 feet and above. Uh, the yellow line means it ranges from 10 to 12 feet, and the red line is four to six feet, and uh, deep red is below four feet. And so just to compare, the current uh, FEMA 100-year base flood elevation is uh, 11 feet at, uh, within our project limit. So as you can see, the majority part of our project, which is from one to two, is well below that limit. So the last time we presented our project was back in June and we were still planning to go with the interim approach. So, so for the causeway, we were thinking about uh, to raise it to year 2050 elevation. Uh, but since then, the programming and environment linkage study has been completed, the PEL study, and they actually recommended to keep the existing corridor or stay on the existing corridor for the long-term project. And to align with that recommendation and also to avoid any future throwaway costs, uh, the project development team decided to go with the causeway option for the entire project limit. And uh, also for the year 2130, rather than going with interim 2050. So the alternative we are working on currently is a causeway from 101 to all the way to Atherton Avenue. However, uh, we don't have the funding to do the causeway for the entire stretch at this moment. So we were going, we are going with the phased implementation approach and the first phase of the project will be replacement of the Novata Creek Bridge uh, to the elevation of 2130. Uh, and we, we are still working on the length of the new bridge. Uh, we are still working on the details. We don't know at this moment what the length will be, but the first fundable package will be the replacement of the Novata Creek Bridge. And uh, this is basically our schedule. So we started in summer of 2021, the environmental process, and last November uh, 17, 2021, we did the first scoping meeting and we heard from the agency, we heard from the public. So we went back to our drawing travel and this is the new alternative we have. And we will have a scope update meeting in two weeks on December 14 at 5.30. Uh, advertisement and invitation will go out soon. And we are targeting to circulate the draft environmental document uh, by February 2023, uh, finish up the complete environmental phase by June 2023. And uh, if funding becomes available, then depending on funding availability, we'll start the construction in 2027. Uh, I don't have any question or answer slide, but if you have any question, thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, appreciate that very much. And um, I'll look to my colleagues to see if there's any questions. If I do see um, committee member Lucan, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Um, curious, uh, the Novato Creek Bridge replacement, are you saying that it would be at the same height as a future causeway and therefore it would tie in when the causeway were to get, get built? Yes. All right. And then um, what is, in part of, at, at this stage of the game, what's being done with rail right there in that corridor, given you know, the rail line is at the about, you know, I think just a, a, a tad higher than the road. Um, uh, how is that being uh, being brought in here with SMART? Um, we, are, we are coordinating with our partners in SMART. Uh, the first, right now, the, the option that we are considering don't have the rail in the bridge. Uh, we were going with the PEL recommendation uh, to, uh, to 12 feet lane on each direction and express running shoulder and a separated bike path. Uh, but we'll keep continuing coordinating with our smart uh, partner. And if needed, uh, we'll work on the real plan too. But just for 
uh, this project, the Novata Creek Bridge, don't have any uh, rail line attached to it. All right, I would I would definitely recommend as much coordination as possible. Uh, you know, at this stage of the game, um, just just given the, the height, height of that rail line. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any uh, questions for? Ahmad? I would just reiterate the coordination uh, on the rail. It seems to me, uh, I mean, that will end up being a, a detriment to the entire project if the rail is kept at the, the lower level um, um, when everything else is rising and um, uh, needs to be uh, incorporated into that ultimate um, build out. So appreciate that. Um, one last chance. Anyone else have any questions on this one? Not seeing any hands raised, Drew. Uh, look to the public for any comments on 4.2. All right, I see three members of the public in line for on public comment, and we will start with uh, Kate Powers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Kate, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for the presentation. I'm glad to hear that uh, the bridge is going to be built at the elevation of the causeway. I was wondering if there are any um, funds already set aside for the Novato Bridge. Um, I understand that complete funding isn't available for it yet, but uh, is there any funding that has already been set aside or identified for the, um, the rebuilding of the bridge? Thanks, Kate. We'll, we'll get you that. We'll circle back on that um, after public comment here. All right, next I have in line is Gita Dev. Gita, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Unless that might be a legacy hand from last item. So we'll move on to Ed Schulte. Ed, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. I think Eric Oaken's questions uh, answered. Uh, that was my concern about making sure that the bridge is compatible with the ultimate project of the causeway. Great, thank you. All right, thank you, Ed. Uh, Chair Abbott. I don't see any other members of the public with their hands up. Great. Thank you, Drew. I'll bring it back. And uh, there was a one question regarding the funding, specific funding of the Novato Creek Bridge. And I don't know if Anne, maybe, um, can you just uh, give us stats on that? Sure, Chair Rabbit. Uh, Ann Richmond, Executive Director with TAM. So uh, as far as I know, the funding that's been identified for that work so far includes 10 million um, in Caltrans funds for the environmental work, and then another $20 million state earmark that was um, set aside in this current fiscal year. Um, that's uh, dedicated to that, to the design essentially of that project. So Dina's nodding. So I think that's all the funding that, uh, that has been identified so far. That is correct. And we've also submitted that uh, bridge as one of the priorities for the district should we receive any uh, climate action funding. Or resiliency funding. Great, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for uh, answering that. Um, if there's no more uh, questions uh, from my colleagues, we'll move on then to 4.3, which is the smart integration. Speaking of which, and uh, we're going to turn to James Cameron from SCTA. James, thank you. So, just to give a brief update on incorporating smart into the partnership, we do have the six party memorandum of understanding for the resilient state route 37 program. It is going to each of the four North Bay counties uh, boards for approval to integrate it into a seven way agreement, uh, including smart and uh, that's expected to be completed late this year or early next year to make them official partner. With that being said. Uh, We've already incorporated SMART into these meetings, and I do want to pass it to Daryl Halls as well as Eddie Cummings to give a little update from their side. Daryl? Eddie, do you want to go first, Eddie, and I'll follow you? Or let, me go, let me go first. Go ahead. Okay, so we have we did have a coordination meeting that Eddie helped coordinate among the counties. Uh, there's a lot of, there's obviously follow-up work. There was a feasibility study done by SMART, I think, a couple of years ago, more of an engineering study. So Eddie's been working with Cal Calsta, get some funding to do, look at, you know, project cost, ridership, and kind of the next step. So SMART will be the lead on that. Uh, in Vallejo, uh, Mayor McConnell's asked us to look at feasibility of rail in Vallejo. Uh, there's both the SMART connection, but also 
as you're probably aware, we're Capital Quarter County. So Capital Quarter is looking at alignment issues because they need to replace the Benicia Bridge rail crossing. And also there's there's um, Link 21. So we're going to be in parallel working with Vallejo and with SMART to look at the feasibility of Vallejo as well. So there's going to be kind of two coordinated studies going on. But I want to thank Eddie for pulling that meeting together. Thanks, Darrow. Yeah, we appreciate all the partnership uh, and happy to happy to be a part of this group. So the things we'll be looking at, we'll be looking at the existing alignment. Um, uh, we'll be looking at things really to look at what is infrastructure would be needed to make that project come to fruition. Be looking at things like pulsed headways, ridership goals, uh, freight accommodation, vehicle type, and then how would you phase that project um, if it were to go into construction. So we'll learn a lot through that process. I just appreciate working with everyone. Like as uh, Daryl mentioned, we had a great meeting and uh, just look forward to continuing to work with that group in the future. Great, thank you, Eddie, appreciate that. Appreciate your leadership at SMART. And Daryl, thank you. Um, and I'll look to my colleagues to see if there's any questions on uh, the integration of SMART within our policy committee and our projects going forward. Uh, committee member Garcia. Yes, thank you, appreciate the presentation. Certainly uh, longer term thinking of uh, rail also, it's just going to consider the uh, connecting to the Capitol Corridor uh, from uh, Valley on up through uh, uh, Jameson Canyon. I think it'll be a good project to have, uh, be able to have transportation from Sacramento all the way over here to Nevada and points west. Appreciate the project uh, presentation. That's uh, very helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Leon. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Daryl, you have your hand up. Was that from before? Yeah, just a follow up with Leon Garcia's comment. We're working with Cal also on our end of the corridor because, as you know, one of the connections in the, in the state rail plan is to connect <coughs> all the way through American Canyon to Sassoon City, where the Capitol Corridor is located. So we're working on a station design process with Cal and Capitol Corridor, looking at the Sassoon Amtrak station, which has been designated as a, a Solano rail hub. So we are looking to make sure we can accommodate SMART in the future if it's feasible. So I just wanted to let you know that planning is going on. Great. Appreciate that. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, Drew, I don't see any other hands from my colleagues. Anyone from the public have anything to say on item 4.3? I'm confirming right now that I don't see any members of the public with their hands up to speak on this item, Chair Rabbit. Great. I think uh, it's just great that we're all working together and uh, moving in the same direction on that. Uh, item 4.4 .4 is resource agency partnering. And uh, this is going to be uh, with Andy Vermeer and Dina L. Twansey. I think Dina is going to lead off. Is that correct? That's correct, Chair Rapid. Good morning, everyone. Just a quick uh, update on where we're, uh, we're at with the resource agencies. So the coordination continues on. We've been coordinating on several levels. Of course, on the project team level, we've been meeting with resource agencies on a regular basis just to uh, discuss projects details and and uh, you know address concerns and and comments from them, but also on the executive level, uh, we've had uh, an intense uh, coordination uh, discussions that have been going on on a weekly basis. Andy and myself have been meeting with um, Chuck Bowen from uh, who's the director of the Fish and Wildlife Services, who is also coordinating with other resource agencies. To, um, to bridge the gap as to where uh, we need to be from their perspective and where the projects are going. We're really focusing on multiple things. Uh, one of them is the interim project B and uh, basically minimizing the footprint of the project as much as possible uh, from a design perspective and how we're gonna move that forward to minimize the impacts and any uh, fill to the bay. Uh, but we're also looking at what the project is doing in terms of uh, environmental um, and ecological restorations uh, at Tolay Creek and also at uh, the uh, enhanced uh, strip marsh that we're proposing as part of the project. Uh, on the western end, on the interim uh, A project, which was just, uh, you just briefly heard uh, uh, um, the update from Ahmad on, we also are indicating to the resource agencies that we are moving in the direction of putting that bridge at the ultimate location for 2100, which is something that they're really pleased to hear as part of the, in the uh, in, interim uh, project um, design and construction. Uh, we will continue on with that effort. I think the, um, the important part is really 
uh, talking to the resource agencies about the ultimate plan. They want to see how the ultimate and the interim are overlapping. Where are we? Where and how are we minimizing any throwaway? Uh, and that's definitely the focus. The Pell has been really a great uh, help in that effort. Uh, as we are laying out our implementation plans in the in the Pell, you know, it's, I think it's becoming real um, to everyone how we are going to move and proceed forward, and in, in, in what is the thinking behind the segments, the different phases on the the ultimate project. Um, so that's ongoing conversations. I've been away for a couple of weeks out of the country, so I just want to pivot to Andy. Um, to see if there's anything else I've missed that you'd like to add. Thank you, Dina. Uh, Andrew from here again, MTC. Uh, yeah, look, I, I've been very impressed by the progress we've made with the state of California, both at the transportation and resource agency level. Um, we've been working very closely with the technical staffs of a lot of the state and federal resource agencies to make sure that the interim projects do as much <laughs> as they can to move them towards resiliency improvements in the corridor. And so, the commitment to replace Tolde Creek uh, and really expand the footprint of that really allows for a lot of restoration opportunities to come forward. And frankly, as was mentioned by the Sierra Club member, we are also committing to working on the strip march, which is around uh, Skaggs Island on the uh, west side of the corridor. And that's really an important improvement project to make sure that the the marsh is protected uh, during all of this work. And so we're, we're very comfortable with the progress of the work. We hope at the next policy meeting, we'll, we'll have a lot more to say about the, the success of that discussion, um, but we, we are moving forward. And I think it's pretty consistent with a lot of the comments that we're seeing and hearing from today. Great, thank you, uh, Andy. Thank you, uh, Dina, for all the work there. And I'll look to my colleagues to see if there's any questions, comments, concerns. Not seeing any hands raised. Uh, appreciate the update. Uh, Drew, is there anyone from the public who'd like to speak on this particular item? Um, confirming at this moment, Chair Rabbit, I do not see any members of the public who wish to speak on this item. Okay. And uh, again, we thank you for the work and we continue forward um, with that relationship as well. Moving on then to 4.5, Sears Point to Mirror Island Improvement Project. And we have Kevin uh, Chen with us from MTC. Kevin? Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Chen, an MTC staff, uh, here to provide an update on yeah. the point to my island improvement project. Um, so the first update is on the environmental document. Um, during the last meeting in September, Rebecca Long of MTC uh, did provide an update on tolling that unfortunately with SB 1050 not moving forward, um, we are pivoting to uh, obtaining uh, the toll authority approval from the California Transportation Commission or the CTC, uh, utilizing the existing authority under the Streets and Highways Code, uh, Section 149.7. And as discussed last time, the main difference between SB 1050 uh, and our current approach with the CTC authority is that SB 1050 would have allowed us to implement tolling on all lanes. Um, with the CTC uh, tolling authority, we would only be tolling uh, one lane in each direction. So essentially uh, with this project, um, you know, the construction would be pretty much the same as uh, how it's been presented in the draft environmental document. Um, you know, basically we'll be converting the existing lane to an HOV lane, which will not be tolled. Um, and then the new lane that's gonna be constructed from, the, uh, from this project will be uh, tolled. So um, by having the HOB lane uh, not told, it would actually uh, further incentivize the use of carpooling uh, and for folks to, um, to take a bus transit. And, and as we've talked about multiple times, the, uh, you know, we, we, we are working very closely with uh, the STA uh, and the partner agencies who, to implement bus transit as part of the project. Um, and you know, uh, with this new update in tolling, uh, we do have to incorporate these changes into the final environmental document. So we are in the process of uh, making all those edits. And our goal uh, is to finalize the environmental document uh, by this calendar year, uh, but depending on the final approval from Caltrans. Um, the second update I'd like to provide is on the actual CTC tolling application process. So the project team has been coordinating um, very closely with CTC staff. Uh, in, the, in the development of the application. Uh, and we are aiming to submit an application early next year, uh, likely in January or February. 
um, uh, BEIFA, the Bay Area Infrastructure Financing uh, Authority, will be the proposed tolling authority for SR37. And many of you are very familiar with BEIFA, which is also the operator of the MTC express lanes in the region. Um, and as part of the application process, we will be working with uh, CTC to hold a public meeting um, for the for the proposed tolling. Uh, and we are targeting February to hold this public meeting, which will likely be a hybrid in-person um, and uh, virtual meeting setting. So uh, we hope to have more information to share that uh, later on. And uh, as far as the approval for tolling, we are uh, looking uh, to get approval from the March CTC Commission meeting uh, next year. Um, so uh, that's the current plan on the tolling application with CTC. The last update uh, is uh, on SB funding for this project. Um, I'm happy to report out that you know we did submit a nomination for this project under the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program in November uh, last month. Uh, and we're seeking for $80 million from uh, this program on this project. We're also working very closely with uh, Caltrans uh, to co-nominate this project under the Solutions for Congested Corridors Program for $70 million. Uh, that application should be going in uh, tomorrow. Uh, with a, a, That's the deadline. So I, I really want to acknowledge the many letters of support we received from elected officials and organizations um, to that would really help us, uh, you know, pursue those grants and, uh, and so that we can deliver this project. So uh, that's my update on the Sears Point to Maryland to Maryland Improvement Project, and happy to take any questions. Great, thank you, Kevin. Appreciate your work. Uh, look to my colleagues. Any questions for Kevin? And I do see a hand raised by uh, committee member Lucan. Go ahead, Eric. Um, yeah, just just one count. I, I know we've uh, we've received or a few more letters have have come in uh, with regards to the segment. Uh, one, I think, just as of recent from the uh, Federated Indians of Great Rancheria, which is not insignificant. Um, uh, any any comments on on you know these letters that continue to come in? Um, yeah, I think we we just have to uh, we'll be working with the partners to, uh, to look at those uh, letters as they come in, and then we'll be providing. I guess we'll be looking at the group to provide response. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, committee member Spearing. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, has there, uh, Kevin, has there been any discussion about putting the emphasis on the disadvantaged communities or the middle and low income people that use that corridor? It seems like, you know, there's very little emphasis put on a generation that'll be totally disregarded if we just go for the ultimate project. And, you know, in our surveys and talking to people, you know, most of them are willing to, to pay the toll if they could pick up, you know, hours of time with their family, quality of life, the very things the chairman was talking about earlier. And it seems like we're not making that an issue as we bring this thing forward to the legislature. You know, I, to, it's unfortunate the congressman just totally disregards that. And so I just have a concern that that issue is being lost in this corridor. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I guess in our past present presentations and I think in future presentations as well on this project, uh, we, we, we do emphasize a lot on equity. Um, you know, we do believe this project does address equity in, 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 in foes, um, Commissioner Spearing. I think, as you said, you know, uh, equity is a huge challenge right now because, you know, they are getting stuck in traffic for, uh, for hours every day. Um, so the congestion relief that the project would pro provide, um, the amount of time saved, uh, uh, it is a, a big um, release, uh, sorry, a relief to the commuters from an equity standpoint. Um, you know, they do gain a lot uh, from an, you know, uh, economical standpoint uh, for time save. Uh, it's also a better quality of life. And then in addition, um, we also providing, we're going to be providing bus transit on this corridor, which does not exist today. So that's another way for us to address equity on this corridor. And as far as, as tolling is concerned, then we will we'll continue to work with other partners um, and, and the tolling uh, authority to um, hopefully come up with a, a program to uh, provide mean space discount for those that qualify uh, as another way to address uh, equity on this corridor. So, uh, yeah, Kevin, what, what, and everybody that's on this committee, you know, has been committed to protecting the environment and helping these commuters. And 
But I, uh, the point I was trying to make is it doesn't seem like we emphasize that when we talk to the CTC, we talk to our legislators. It's, it's you know, and so I just, you know, I hope MTC will put an emphasis on that portion of it. You know, that, that we do have people that are that are being impacted in a in a very meaningful way. And so it just seems like you know we're not sending that message strong enough. That that was the point I was trying to make. So thank you, thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Appreciate those comments. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Andy Vermeer, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, if if you don't mind, Chair, uh, Commissioner Sparing, I think you're exactly right, and we are trying to do that. I, I would say a couple of things. You know, the the failure of the Dodd legislation to move, move forward really put a few more challenges in front of us. And as you've seen from these presentations, this is an extremely difficult program. And I think we're making, you know, quite a bit of slow, steady progress, but we're a long ways from any finish lines. Um, what we would like to do and what we'll be talking about, I think, at this committee for the next couple of years during design of the interim phase is to try to work with legislation to get more authority to the CTC to help us with pricing. Because the move that we had to make from the presumptions in the Dodd legislation to what is allowed in the CTC's current authority really creates some operational challenges for us when we open the facility. But we're hopeful with your help and with the help of a lot of folks in the legislature that we can get a little bit more authority by the time we're ready to open up the project to um, the, the commute folks. And I, I do think we need to concentrate on your point exactly and we need to emphasize that. And I think that's actually one of the big struggles with trying to move forward on much of the ultimate project is it's a lot of significant uh, impacts that I am sure will delay the opening several years if we if we have to do much in that space beyond what we've already contemplated. So look, I, I, I appreciate the challenge in all aspects of what we're talking about, but we're, we're, we're just trying to keep moving forward as best we can with what limited authority and what limited financing we have today. Appreciate that as well. Um, and again, I'll look to my colleagues for any other comments on this particular piece. I uh, obviously said it earlier, and I agree with uh, committee member Sparing. I think equity has many facets, certainly quality of life um, and the amount of hours taken away from someone um, who is a working class person that needs to commute to their to their work um, is vitally important and I think could, cannot be ignored. And I think we need to also, quite honestly, continue to talk about the um, the unique project that this is, that the uh, environmental enhancement is really not necessarily mitigation, but truly enhancement of, of a corridor that is an added benefit and a, and a very unique benefit. And I think that, we, as we all know, you know, maybe that the one project down in San Diego is the only other one in the state to do that. Um, but Kevin, thank you so much for your work and your committed um, commitment and professionalism going forward. We can cont uh, continue uh, uh, down this path. So thank you for that. Um, I'll look to Drew and see if there's if there's no more hands raised by my colleagues. If there's anyone from the public who'd like to speak on this particular item. Uh, yeah, so I see four members of the public wishing to speak on this item right now. And we will start with Cynthia Murray. Cynthia, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. All right. Um, instead, we're going to go with Steve Bertelbaugh. Uh, Steve, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Yes, thank you for this update on the uh, tolling issue. Uh, the uh, uh, problem that I see is that tolling just on the uh, B segment uh, is not very fair to the people that live at the end of that segment. Uh, the tolling should apply to both the B and the A segments uh, because someone who's driving from Vallejo uh, is going to be paying the toll, but people that are driving from the city of Sonoma are not going to be paying any toll. Um, certainly by the time we get to the ultimate project, the tolling should apply all the way along the road. Um, and I'd like to see something done on that on that level. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. 
Uh, next in line is Ed Schultze. Ed, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Fine, thank you. Uh, I missed uh, uh, the hand raise when Tammy was making a presentation. I hate to go backwards, but uh, one thing that wasn't mentioned was the Lakeville intersection on section four. That's a major <laughs> intersection that a lot of traffic that goes north. It's a major truck thoroughfare from central California to northern California. So I think that they should look at an intersection there and maybe create another uh, section for it. And also the headquarters for the, uh, re uh, for the refuge there, that's at a pretty high elevation. I think that could be uh, mitigated with just a frontage road from the existing headquarters to 121 intersection. Thank you. Again, thanks, uh, Tammy, for doing all she's done and, and color coding this. It makes it easy to see. And we still have her cell phone number. <laughs> all righty. Thank you, Ed. And last we have in line is Kate Powers. Kate, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you for um, the, the report. I had two questions. One was... Um, whether or not there's any information to share about the permitting agencies, do they um, do they weigh in during once the draft EIR is uh, released, or if MTC is working with them now um, on the mitigation projects and how permitting is is advancing? And then the other was um, just in terms of funding. In addition to the eighty million dollar uh, grant application and the congested corridors application um, and then future tolling. I was wondering if there's any other um, funding sources that have been counted on or are applied for for this uh, interim project. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kate. Uh, Chair Rabbit, I don't see any other members of the public who wish to speak on this item. Great, thank you, Drew. Appreciate the work again. and. Uh... Uh, Andy, could you help us on those last two uh, questions? One was, uh, I think you hit on it prior, the permitting agency cooperation and then any other funding sources, if you can. Um, yeah, so I, I, I do think that the work with the resource agencies will identify very clearly what kinds of commitments we can make for the improvements in the interim project that are very supportive of not only access to um, you know, some of the Bay Trail improvements are there, but also the, all of the access we've been talking about all morning that I think are, are very important, both to Commissioner Sparing's question about equity and otherwise. Um, in terms of funding, we've got a very complicated funding plan uh, and we're moving forward as best we can with applications and we're going to know a lot more as the spring comes forward how successful we are in, in um, reaching some of those commitments that we've put together in, in our plan. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, I'll, our last item in uh, our discussion or information items today is the transit plan update and we have Brandon Thompson from Sol uh, Solano Transportation Authority to give us that quick presentation. Brandon? Perfect. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Brandon Thompson with Solano Transportation Authority. I'm uh, here to update on the transit and rideshare element. Uh, so this corridor has been studied uh, previously um, uh, in Napa Valley Transportation Authority uh, previously studied this corridor under that study it demonstrated the low density dispersed travel uh, demand along the corridor. Uh, under that study, the three largest trip originating cities were Vallejo, Fairfield and Novato have a high propensity for state route 37 transit use. Uh, the study really concluded that there is demand for fixed route service between Vallejo, Fairfield and Novato based on travel volumes and propensity. Ride sharing is already a significant and would uh, benefit uh, from more park and ride locations and semi fixed route uh, minibus service along uh, State Route 37 would be viable. Uh, the connect and mobility moving this plan forward. Uh, we are really looking at, at how one uh, individual could get from their location to their destination without using a single occupancy vehicle. Uh, in order to make this uh, dream a reality, it's going to take investments in mobility hubs, providing local uh, transit and active transportation access to regional transit opportunities, 
of course, a fixed route operated by Soul Trans, uh, potentially to Novato, and then complementing uh, the transit services with uh, competitive ride sharing programs, such as uh, Ride, Am ride Amigos and other active transportation plans. Uh, the updated uh, State Route 37 transit proposal is really looking at two uh, terminus locations. Uh, uh, the first would be uh, in Novato. Uh, again, this uh, uh, would take a culmination of uh, uh, park and ride investments, uh, uh, mobility programs such as the first last mile and other active uh, transportation programs. Uh, the second alternative uh, that's being analyzed is uh, terminus in uh, San Rafael. Uh, looking at uh, park and ride uh, uh, improvements at uh, Vallejo Fairgrounds, Bear Island, uh, Black Point, Alameda del Prado, and Smith Ranch. Uh, and again, would be uh, complemented with uh, mobility programs such as First Last Mile and other active transportation programs. Here in Solano, uh, we are uh, making some improvements uh, in our mobility hubs. Uh, Vallejo Fairgrounds, uh, new mobility hub coming online in uh, next uh, year or so. Uh, we'll be uh, providing connections to Salon Express, uh, Napa Vine, and other uh, Soul Trans Local. We're utilizing uh, Lyft currently for Solano First Last Mile. And uh, a big benefit, it's going to be supporting the Solano 360 development with uh, about 500 uh, plus new homes. Uh, in the downtown Nevada, uh, uh, Alternative 1 or San Rafael Alternative 2, uh, again, there's going to be uh, investments in uh, Mobility hubs, we're going to connect to Golden Gate Transit, Marin Transit, as well as Smart, utilize Uber uh, Connected Transit Program, and over a million dollars uh, investments are proposed in Marin Access Improvements. Uh, currently, uh, here in Solano, uh, we contract a regional service out to Soul Trans, who operates the Solano Express uh, Red and uh, Green Line, running along the 80 corridor, connecting to Fairfield, Vallejo, it will be uh, vital for future State Route 37 uh, service. We're also uh, going uh, uh, green. Uh, SDA will be installing eight inductive charging pads at regional significant transit centers. And I'd like to thank our, our partners uh, with BART, Soul Trans, WIDA, Capital Corridor, and NVTA. As far as uh, the particular service on State Route 37, uh, we're proposing uh, uh, 5 a.m. to 9 p.m., uh, Monday through Friday, with a 30 minute headway. Off peak would be hourly. Uh, peak uh, bus requirements uh, does deviate depending on where the terminus location is. Uh, to Vallejo to Nevado uh, would require uh, four buses. Uh, Vallejo to San Rafael would require five. Uh, additional uh, revenue hours would be roughly uh, 12,000 uh, going into Nevado, 16,000 into San Rafael. Uh, the operating costs, uh, the proposed transit would cost between 2.3 million annually uh, to Nevado and 2.9 million to San Rafael. Uh, capital costs uh, to that end would be about one, uh, about 6.6 .6 million to 8 million, depending on the termini location. Uh, the fairgrounds drive mobility improvement is roughly about 5.4 million dollars. The accident, uh, access improvements in Marin, a little over a million dollars. Uh, total capital uh, projections uh, would be about 15 million to Novato, or about 16.2 million into San Rafael. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Brandon, thank you so much for that presentation, and uh, I'll look to my colleagues. I do see uh, Daryl with his hand up. Go ahead, Daryl. Yeah, well, thanks, Brandon. Um, we, we want to acknowledge we've had several meetings with the Marin operators that Ann staff co uh, coordinated, and with Sonoma operators that Suzanne staff coordinated. This is still a work in progress, but there was a timing mechanism. Caltrans needed the multimodal component of the interim project, so we had to submit this concept about three weeks ago as a concept. There's still a lot of opportunity, a lot of flexibility. Is this good shape? Obviously, we're still a couple of years away from the interim project. So we just want to get a concept out. out. So we welcome any comments the committee members may have. Thanks, Earl. Appreciate that. And again, I'll look to my colleagues to see if there's any questions, comments, or concerns. I am. I, I do see one. Uh, committee <laughs> members, Baird. Hey, David, thank you. You know, I, you know, I want to thank the staff, the, all the four counties for, you know, looking at this transit option in the front of this process, you know, because I think that if we do build a facility, that transit option has to be available the day we open it. And so, so I appreciate the fact that we're doing all this work ahead of uh, the development of the corridor itself. And, uh, you know, because I think the transit is going to be an extremely important component and the four counties working on how that's going to work. 
I think it's going to be part of our success and the support we're going to get for this project. So I just want to thank staff for being out in front on this transit piece. I will uh, I'll, uh, reiterate or uh, also say the same thing, but um, in understanding too, and as um, committee member Spearing well knows and serving in the Blue Ribbon Transit Recovery Task Force, the um, the changes in transit going forward, um, and at the same time trying to implement a, a, a new service across this corridor. Um, I appreciate the fact that we're really looking um, kind of outside the box, certainly on the first last mile, the, the mobility hubs, and to really make it sure that it's going to be an, an attractive way uh, to get someone out of their car and hopefully uh, a, a first choice and not a, a, a choice because there's no other. Um, so I, I, I do appreciate that and appreciate the work in that. Um, and I do see a committee member Lucan with his hand up. Go ahead, Eric. I just want to make sure that that deck that got presented could could get sent out because I didn't see it in the original agenda packet. Uh, I'll be sure to send it to you, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Hey, if you could do that for all of us, that'd be great because I I was trying to write down those numbers real quickly. Uh, per perfect. Perfect. And I'll, I'll I'll ask Drew if there's anyone from the public who'd like to speak on this item. Yeah, and I'll make sure I'll send all the presentations out to the committee as well as post them online. Thanks, Drew. And with that, um, I do see one member of the public who wishes to speak. And we have Steve Bertelbau. I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you. I'm I'm really glad to see that this is moving forward. And uh, uh, I, I hope that we will support it uh, regardless of how uh, how difficult it is to get people to shift into public transit. Um, transportation really does drive development and the availability of this uh, is likely to result in changes in, in our patterns. So uh, I hope that we don't have expectations that are too high for the first two to five years that this is going. Uh, and stick with it and and make it real. Uh, Golden Gate Bus is a good example of, of what we were able to do by having good transit. We probably will need to re, uh, reinforce it by making people pay to park in Marin County. And that'll be a tough lift, but uh, uh, San Francisco's pricing for parking had a big effect on the use of uh, Golden Gate Transit. And then we have the pandemic to recover from, but Let's stay the course. Thank you. Right, thank you, Steve. Uh, Chair Rabbit, I don't see any other members of the public who wish to speak on this item. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that and appreciate the comments. Um, with that, we'll move on. <laughs> move on to committee member uh, comments or staff updates. Anyone have anything for the good of the order? Not seeing any hands raised. Uh, well, uh, is that a hand raised there? Yeah. Uh, committee member uh, Ramos. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to, to bring up at the request of um, Supervisor Hannigan, who wasn't able to join us, um, if for a future meeting we could schedule um, a, a process for reviewing our chair and vice chair um, appointments for this committee. As we know, we're in this for the long haul. Um, and having all counties um, being able to participate is something that she had expressed a, a, a desire for us to look at in terms of leadership as a future agenda item. That's great. Um, and anyone else have anything? Not seeing any, uh, you can see the future topics uh, in item number six there. Um, and uh, I think with that, it brings us to adjournment. And I think our next meeting is scheduled for March 2nd, 2023. So until then, for those of the, those that we don't see, um, happy holidays, uh, happy new year. <laughs> Seems strange mm -hmm. to get on December 1st, uh, but to staff really, uh, thank you for all the great work um, in continuing forward uh, to solve the problem of Highway 37. So thank you everyone.